Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Seven, recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver continues refractory. Noah Claypole ran along the streets at his swiftest pace, and paused not once for breath until he reached the workhouse gate. Having rested here for a minute or so, to collect a good burst of sobs and an imposing show of tears and terror, he knocked loudly at the wicket, and presented such a rueful face to the aged pauper who opened it, that even he, who saw nothing but rueful faces about him at the best of times, started back in astonishment. "'Why, what's the matter with the boy?' said the old pauper. "'Mr. Bumble! Mr. Bumble!' cried Noah, with well-affected dismay, and in tones so loud and agitated that they not only caught the ear of Mr. Bumble himself, who happened to be hard by, but alarmed him so much that he rushed into the yard without his cocked hat, which is a very curious and remarkable circumstance, as showing that even a beadle, acted upon a sudden and powerful impulse, may be afflicted with a momentary visitation of loss of self-possession and forgetfulness of personal dignity. "'Oh, Mr. Bumble, sir!' said Noah. "'Oliver, sir! O Oliver has—' "'What? What?' interposed Mr. Bumble, with a gleam of pleasure in his metallic eyes. "'Not run away. He hasn't run away, has he, Noah?' "'No, sir. No. Not run away, sir. He's turned wishes,' replied Noah. "'He tried to murder me, sir. And then he tried to murder Charlotte, and then Mrs. Oh, what dreadful pain it is!' "'Such agony! Please, sir!' And here Noah writhed and twisted his body into an extensive variety of eel-like positions, thereby giving Mr. Bumble to understand that, from the violent and sanguinary onset of Oliver Twist, he had sustained severe internal injury and damage, from which he was at that moment suffering the acutest torture. When Noah saw that the intelligence he communicated perfectly paralysed Mr. Bumble, he imparted additional effect thereunto, by bewailing his dreadful wounds ten times louder than before. And when he observed a gentleman in a white waistcoat crossing the yard, he was more tragic in his lamentations than ever, rightly conceiving it highly expedient to attract the notice and rouse the indignation of the gentleman aforesaid. The gentleman's notice was very soon attracted, for he had not walked three paces when he turned angrily round and inquired what that young cur was howling for, and why Mr. Bumble did not favour him with something which would render the series of vocular exclamations so designated an involuntary process. "'It's a poor boy from the free school, sir,' replied Mr. Bumble, "'who has been nearly murdered, all but murdered, sir, by young Twist.' "'My Jove!' exclaimed the gentleman in the white waistcoat, stopping short. Oh, "'I knew it.' I felt a strange presentiment from the very first that that audacious young savage would come to be hung. He has likewise attempted, sir, to murder the female servant," said Mr. Bumble, with a face of ashy paleness. "'And his missus,' interposed Mr. Claypole. "'And his master, too, I think you said, Noah,' added Mr. Bumble. "'Oh, no! He's out! Or, or he would have murdered him,' replied Noah. He, "'He said he wanted to.' Ah. "'Said he wanted to, did he, my boy?' inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Yes, sir,' replied Noah. "'And please, sir, Mrs. wants to know whether Mr. Bumble can spare time to step up there directly and flog him, cause master's out.' "'Certainly, my boy, certainly,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat, smiling benignly and patting Noah's head, which was about three inches higher than his own. "'You're a good boy, a very good boy.' Here's a penny for you. Bumble, just step up to Sowerberry's with your cane, and see what's best to be done. Don't spare him, Bumble." "'No, I will not, sir,' replied the beadle. And the cocked hat and cane, having been by this time adjusted to their owner's satisfaction, Mr. Bumble and Noah Claypole betook themselves with all speed to the undertaker's shop. Here the position of affairs had not at all improved. Sowerberry had not yet returned and Oliver continued to kick with undiminished vigour at the cellar door. The accounts of his ferocity, as related by Mrs. Sowerberry and Charlotte, were of so startling a nature that Mr. Bumble judged it prudent to parley before opening the door. With this view he gave a kick at the outside, by way of prelude, and, 
then applying his mouth to the keyhole, said, in a deep and impressive tone, "'Oliver!' "'Come! You let me out!' replied Oliver from the inside. "'Do you know this here voice, Oliver?' said Mr. Bumble. "'Yes,' replied Oliver. "'Ain't you afraid of it, sir? Ain't you a-trembling while I speak, sir?' said Mr. Bumble. "'No!' replied Oliver boldly. An answer, so different from the one he had expected to elicit, and was in the habit of receiving, staggered Mr. Bumble not a little. He stepped back from the keyhole, drew himself up to his full height, and looked from one to another of the three bystanders, in mute astonishment. "'Oh, you know, Mr. Bumble, he must be mad,' said Mrs. Sowerberry. "'No boy in half his senses would venture to speak so to you.' "'It's not madness, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble, after a few moments of deep meditation. "'It's meat.' "'What?' exclaimed Mrs. Sowerberry. "'Meat, ma'am, meat,' replied Bumble, with stern emphasis. "'You've overfed him, ma'am. You've raised an artificial soul and spirit in him, ma'am, unbecoming a person of his condition. As the board, Mrs. Sowerberry, who are practical philosophers, will tell you. What have paupers to do with soul or spirit? It's quite enough that we let them have live bodies. If you had kept the boy on gruel, ma'am, this would never have happened." "'Dear, dear!' ejaculated Mrs. Sowerberry, piously raising her eyes to the kitchen ceiling. "'This comes of being liberal!' The liberality of Mrs. Sowerberry to Oliver had consisted of a profuse bestowal upon him of all the dirty odds and ends which nobody else would eat so there was a great deal of meekness and self-devotion in her voluntarily remaining under Mr. Bumble's heavy accusation, of which, to do her justice, she was wholly innocent in thought, word, or deed. "'Ah!' said Mr. Bumble, when the lady brought her eyes down to earth again. "'The only thing that can be done now, that I know of, is to leave him in the cellar for a day or so till he's a little starved down, and then to take him out and keep him on gruel all through the apprenticeship. He comes of a bad family. Excitable natures, Mrs. Sowerberry. Both the nurse and doctor said that that mother of his made her way here against difficulties and pain, and would have killed any well-disposed woman weeks before." At this point of Mr. Bumble's discourse, Oliver, just hearing enough to know that some allusion was being made to his mother, recommenced kicking, with a violence that rendered every other sound inaudible. Sowerberry returned at this juncture, Oliver's offence having been explained to him, with such exaggerations as the ladies thought best calculated to rouse his ire, he unlocked the cellar door in a twinkling, and dragged his rebellious apprentice out by the collar. Oliver's clothes had been torn in the beating he had received, his face was bruised and scratched, and his hair scattered over his forehead. The angry flush had not disappeared, however, and when he was pulled out of his prison, he scowled boldly on Noah, and looked quite undismayed. "'Now, you're a nice young fellow, ain't you?' said Sowerberry, giving Oliver a shake and a box on the ear. "'He called my mother names,' replied Oliver. "'Well, and what if he did, you little ungrateful wretch?' said Mrs. Sowerberry. "'She deserved what he said, and worse.' "'She didn't,' said Oliver. "'She did,' said Mrs. Sowerberry. "'It's a lie!' said Oliver. Mrs. Sowerberry burst into a flood of tears. This flood of tears left Mr. Sowerberry no alternative. If he had hesitated for one instant to punish Oliver most severely, it must be quite clear to every experienced reader that he would have been, according to all precedents in disputes of matrimony, established, a brute, an unnatural husband, an insulting creature, a base imitation of a man, and various other agreeable characters, too numerous for recital within the limits of this chapter. To do him justice, he was, as far as his power went, it was not very extensive, kindly disposed towards the boy, perhaps because it was his interest to be so, perhaps because his wife disliked him. The flood of tears, however, left him no resource, so he at once gave him a drubbing which satisfied even Mrs. Sowerberry herself and rendered Mr. Bumble's subsequent application of the parochial cane rather unnecessary. For the rest of the day 
he was shut up in the back kitchen, in company with a pump and a slice of bread, and at night Mrs. Sowerberry, after making various remarks outside the door, by no means complimentary to the memory of his mother, looked into the room, and amidst the jeers and pointings of Noah and Charlotte, ordered him upstairs to his dismal bed. It was not until he was left alone in the silence and stillness of the gloomy workshop of the undertaker, that Oliver gave way to the feelings which the day's treatment may be supposed likely to have awakened in a mere child. He had listened to their taunts, with a look of contempt. He had borne the lash without a cry, for he felt the pride, swelling in his heart, which would have kept down a shriek to the last, though they had roasted him alive. But now, when there were none to see or hear him, he fell upon his knees on the floor, and, hiding his face in his hands, wept such tears as, God send for the credit of our nature, few so young may ever have cause to pour out before him. For a long time Oliver remained motionless in this attitude. The candle was burning low in the socket when he rose to his feet. Having gazed cautiously round him, and listened intently, he gently undid the fastenings of the door, and looked abroad. It was a cold, dark night. The stars seemed, to the boy's eyes, farther from the earth than he had ever seen them before. There was no wind, and the sombre shadows thrown by the trees upon the ground looked sepulchral and death-like from being so still. He softly reclosed the door. Having availed himself of the expiring light of the candle to tie up in a handkerchief the few articles of wearing apparel he had, sat himself down upon a bench to wait for morning. With the first ray of light that struggled through the crevices in the shutters, Oliver rose and again unbarred the door. One timid look around, one moment's pause of hesitation, he had closed it behind him, and was in the open street. He looked to the right and to the left, uncertain whither to fly. He remembered to have seen the wagons, as they went out, toiling up the hill. He took the same route, and arriving at a footpath across the fields, which he knew, after some distance, led out again into the road, struck into it, and walked quickly on. Along this same footpath, Oliver well remembered he had trotted beside Mr. Bumble, when he first carried him to the workhouse from the farm. His way lay directly in front of the cottage. His heart beat quickly when he bethought himself of this, and he half resolved to turn back. He had come a long way, though, and should lose a great deal of time by doing so. Besides, it was so early that there was very little fear of his being seen, so he walked on. He reached the house. There was no appearance of its inmates stirring at that early hour. Oliver stopped and peeped into the garden. A child was weeding one of the little beds. As he stopped, he raised his pale face, and disclosed the features of one of his former companions. Oliver felt glad to see him before he went, for though younger than himself he had been his little friend and playmate, they had been beaten and starved and shut up together many and many a time. "'Hush, Dick,' said Oliver, as the boy ran to the gate, and thrust his thin arm between the rails to greet him. "'Is any one up?' "'Nobody but me,' replied the child. "'You mustn't say you saw me, Dick,' said Oliver. "'I'm running away. They beat and ill-use me, Dick, and I'm going to seek my fortune some long way off. I don't know where. How pale you are!' "'I heard a doctor tell them I was dying,' replied the child with a faint smile. "'I'm very glad to see you, my dear. But don't stop. Don't stop. Yes, yes, I will, to say good-bye to you,' replied Oliver. "'I shall see you again, Dick. I know I shall. You will be well and happy.' "'I hope so,' replied the child. After I am dead, but not before. I know the doctor must be right, Oliver, because I dream so much of heaven and angels and kind faces that I never see when I am awake. Kiss me," said the child, climbing up the low gate and flinging his little arms around Oliver's neck. Goodbye, dear. God bless you. The blessing was from a young child's lips, 
but it was the first that Oliver had ever heard invoked upon his head. And through the struggles and sufferings and troubles and changes of his afterlife, he never once forgot it. Chapter Eight of Oliver Twist. Oliver walks to London. He encounters on the road a strange sort of young gentleman. Oliver reached the stile at which the bypath terminated, and once more gained the high road. It was eight o'clock now. Though he was nearly five miles away from the town, he ran and hid behind the hedges by turns till noon, fearing that he might be pursued and overtaken. Then he sat down to rest by the side of the milestone, and began to think, for the first time, where he had better go and try to live. The stone by which he was seated bore in large characters an intimation that it was just seventy miles from that spot to London. The name awakened a new train of ideas in the boy's mind. London! That great place! Nobody, not even Mr. Bumble, could ever find him there. He had often heard the old men in the workhouse, too, say that no lad of spirit need want in London, and that there were ways of living in that vast city which those who had been bred up in country parts had no idea of. It was the very place for a homeless boy who must die in the streets unless someone helped him. As these things passed through his thoughts, he jumped upon his feet and again walked forward. He had diminished the distance between himself and London by full four miles more, before he recollected how much he must undergo ere he could hope to reach his place of destination. As this consideration forced itself upon him, he slackened his pace a little, and meditated upon his means of getting there. He had a crust of bread, a coarse shirt, and two pairs of stockings in his bundle. He had a penny, too, a gift of sourberries, after some funeral in which he had acquitted himself more than ordinarily well, in his pocket. A clean shirt, thought Oliver, is a very comfortable thing, and so are two pairs of darned stockings, and so is a penny, but they are small helps to a sixty-five miles walk in winter-time. But Oliver's thoughts, like those of most other people, although they were extremely ready and active to point out his difficulties, were wholly at a loss to suggest any feasible mode of surmounting them. So, after a good deal of thinking to no particular purpose, he changed his little bundle over to the other shoulder, and trudged on. Oliver walked twenty miles that day, and all that time tasted nothing but the crust of dry bread, and a few draughts of water which he begged at the cottage doors by the roadside. When the night came, he turned into a meadow, and, creeping close under a hayrick, determined to lie there till morning. He felt frightened at first, for the wind moaned dismally over the empty fields, and he was cold and hungry, and more alone than he had ever felt before. Being very tired with his walk, however, he soon fell asleep, and forgot his troubles. He felt cold and stiff when he got up next morning, and so hungry that he was obliged to exchange the penny for a small loaf, in the very first village through which he passed. He had walked no more than twelve miles, when the night closed in again. His feet were sore, and his legs so weak that they trembled beneath him. Another night passed in the bleak damp air, made him worse. When he set forward on his journey next morning, he could hardly crawl along. He waited at the bottom of a steep hill till a stage-coach came up, and then begged of the outside passengers. But there were very few who took any notice of him, and even those told him to wait till they got to the top of the hill, and then let them see how far he could run for a halfpenny. Poor Oliver tried to keep up with the coach a little way, but was unable to do it, by reason of his fatigue and sore feet. When the outsides saw this, they put their halfpens back into their pockets again, declaring that he was an idle young dog, and didn't deserve anything, and the coach rattled away, and left only a cloud of dust behind. In some villages large painted boards were fixed up, warning all persons who begged within the district that they would be sent to jail. This frightened Oliver very much, and made him glad to get out of those villages with all possible expedition. In others, he would stand about the inn-yards, and look mournfully at every one who passed, a proceeding which generally terminated in the landlady's ordering one of the post-boys who were lounging about to drive that strange boy out of the place, for she was sure he had come to steal something. If he begged at a farmer's house, 
ten to one but they threatened to set the dog on him, and when he showed his nose in the shop they talked about the beadle, which brought Oliver's heart into his mouth, very often the only thing he had there for many hours together. In fact, if it had not been for a good-hearted turnpike man, and a benevolent old lady, Oliver's troubles would have been shortened by the very same process which had put an end to his mother's. In other words, he would most assuredly have fallen dead upon the king's highway. But the turnpike man gave him a meal of bread and cheese, and the old lady, who had a shipwrecked grandson, wandering barefoot in some distant part of the earth, took pity upon the poor orphan, and gave him what little she could afford, and more, with such kind and gentle words, and such tears of sympathy and compassion, that they sank deeper into Oliver's soul than all the sufferings he had ever undergone. Early on the seventh morning, after he had left his native place, Oliver limped slowly into the little town of Barnet. The window-shutters were closed, the street was empty, not a soul had awakened to the business of the day. The sun was rising in all its splendid beauty, but the light only served to show the boy his own lonesomeness and desolation, as he sat, with bleeding feet, and covered with dust, upon a doorstep. By degrees the shutters were opened, the window-blinds were drawn up, and people began passing to and fro. Some few stopped to gaze at Oliver for a moment or two, or turned round to stare at him as they hurried by, but none relieved him, or troubled themselves to inquire how he came there. He had no heart to beg, and there he sat. He had been crouching on the step for some time, wondering at the great number of public houses. Every other house in Barnet was a tavern, large or small, gazing listlessly at the coaches as they passed through, and thinking how strange it seemed that they could do, with ease, in a few hours, what it had taken him a whole week of courage and determination beyond his years to accomplish, when he was roused by observing that a boy, who had passed him carelessly some minutes before, had returned, and was now surveying him most earnestly from the opposite side of the way. He took little heed of this at first, but the boy remained in the same attitude of close observation so long, that Oliver raised his head, and returned his steady look. Upon this, the boy crossed over, and walking close up to Oliver, said, "'Hello, my covey! What's the row?' The boy who addressed this inquiry to the young wayfarer was about his own age, but one of the queerest-looking boys that Oliver had ever seen. He was a snub-nosed, flat-browed, common-faced boy enough, and as dirty a juvenile as one would wish to see, but he had about him all the airs and manners of a man. He was short of his age, with rather bow-legs, and little sharp ugly eyes. His hat was stuck on the top of his head so lightly, that it threatened to fall off every moment, and would have done so very often, if the wearer had not had a knack of every now and then giving his head a sudden twitch, which brought it back to its old place again. He wore a man's coat, which reached nearly to his heels. He had turned the cuffs back, halfway up his arm, to get his hands out of the sleeves, apparently with the ultimate view of thrusting them into the pockets of his corduroy trousers, for there he kept them. He was, altogether, as roistering and swaggering a young gentleman as ever stood four feet six, or something less, in the bluchers. "'Hello, my covey! What's the row?' said this strange young gentleman to Oliver. "'I'm very hungry and tired,' replied Oliver, the tears standing in his eyes as he spoke. "'I have walked a long way. I've been walking these seven days.' "'Walking for seven days?' said the young gentleman. "'Oh, I see. Beak's order, eh? But,' he added, noticing Oliver's look of surprise, "'I suppose you don't know what a beak is, my flash companion?' Oliver mildly replied, that he had always heard a bird's mouth described by the term in question. "'My eyes! How green!' exclaimed the young gentleman. "'Why, a beak's a magistrate! And when you walk by a beak's order, it's not straight forward, but always a-going up, and never a-coming down again. Was you never on the mill?" "'What mill?' inquired Oliver. "'What mill? Why, the mill! The mill, as takes up so little room that it'll work inside a stone jug, and always goes better 
when the wind's low with people than when it's high. Of course, then, they can't get workmen. But come, said the young gentleman, you want grub, and you shall have it. I'm at low water mark myself, only one bob and a magpie, but, as far as it goes, I'll fork out and stump. Up with you on your pins. There, now then, Morris. Assisting Oliver to rise, the young gentleman took him to an adjacent chandler's shop, where he purchased a sufficiency of ready-dressed ham and a half-quartern loaf, or, as he himself expressed it, a fourpenny bran, the ham being kept clean and preserved from dust by the ingenious expedient of making a hole in the loaf by pulling out a portion of the crumb and stuffing it therein. Taking the bread under his arm, the young gentleman turned into a small public-house and led the way to a tap-room in the rear of the premises. Here a pot of beer was brought in, by direction of the mysterious youth, and Oliver, falling to at his new friend's bidding, made a long and hearty meal, during the progress of which the strange boy eyed him from time to time with great attention. "'Going to London?' said the strange boy, when Oliver had at length concluded. "'Yes. Got any lodgings?' "'No.' Money? No. The strange boy whistled, and put his arms into his pockets, as far as the big coat-sleeves would let them go. "'Do you live in London?' inquired Oliver. "'Yes, I do, when I'm at home,' replied the boy. "'I suppose you want some place to sleep in to-night, don't you?' "'I do, indeed,' answered Oliver. "'I've not slept under a roof since I left the country.' "'Don't fret your eyelids on that score,' said the young gentleman. "'I've got to be in London to-night, and I know a spectable old gentleman as lives there, what'll give you lodgings for nothing, and never ask for the change. That is, if any gentleman he knows introduces you. And don't he know me? Oh, no, not in the least, by no means, certainly not.' The young gentleman smiled, as if to intimate that the latter fragments of discourse were playfully ironical and finished the beer as he did so. This unexpected offer of shelter was too tempting to be resisted, especially as it was immediately followed up by the assurance that the old gentleman referred to would doubtless provide Oliver with a comfortable place, without loss of time. This led to a more friendly and confidential dialogue, from which Oliver discovered that his friend's name was Jack Dawkins, and that he was a peculiar pet and prodigy of the elderly gentleman before mentioned. Mr. Dawkins's appearance did not say a vast deal in favour of the comforts which his patron's interest obtained for those whom he took under his protection, but, as he had a rather flightly and dissolute mode of conversing, and furthermore avowed that among his intimate friends he was better known by the sobriquet of the Artful Dodger, Oliver concluded that, being of a dissipated and careless turn, the moral precepts of his benefactor had hitherto been thrown away upon him. Under this impression, he secretly resolved to cultivate the good opinion of the old gentleman as quickly as possible. And if he found the Dodger incorrigible, as he more than half suspected he should, to decline the honour of his father acquaintance. As Jack Dawkins objected to their entering London before nightfall, it was nearly eleven o'clock when they reached the turnpike at Islington. They crossed from the Angel into St. John's Road struck down the small street which terminates at Sadler's Wells Theatre, through Exmouth Street and Coppice Row, down the little court by the side of the workhouse, across the classic ground which once bore the name of Hockley in the Hole, thence into Little Saffron Hill, and so into Saffron Hill the Great, along which the Dodger scudded at a rapid pace, directing Oliver to follow close at his heels. Although Oliver had enough to occupy his attention in keeping sight of his leader, he could not help bestowing a few hasty glances on either side of the way as he passed along. A dirtier or more wretched place he had never seen. The street was very narrow and muddy, and the air was impregnated with filthy odours. There were a good many small shops, but the only stock in trade appeared to be heaps of children, who, even at that time of night, were crawling in and out at the doors or screaming from the inside. The sole places that seemed to prosper amid the general blight of the place were the public-houses, and in them the lowest orders of Irish 
were wrangling with might and main. Covered ways and yards, which here and there diverged from the main street, disclosed little knots of houses, where drunken men and women were positively wallowing in filth. And from several of the doorways, great, ill-looking fellows were cautiously emerging, bound to all appearance, on no very well-disposed or harmless errands. Oliver was just considering whether he hadn't better run away, when they reached the bottom of the hill. His conductor, catching him by the arm, pushed open the door of a house near Field Lane, and drawing him into the passage, closed it behind them. "'Now, then!' cried a voice from below, in reply to a whistle from the dodger. "'Plummy and slam!' was the reply. This seemed to be some watchword or signal that all was right, for the light of a feeble candle gleamed on the wall at the remote end of the passage, and a man's face peeped out from where a balustrade of the old kitchen staircase had been broken away. "'There's two on you,' said the man, thrusting the candle farther out, and shielding his eyes with his hand. "'Who's the t'other one?' "'A new pal,' replied Jack Dawkins, pulling Oliver forward. "'Where you come from?' "'Greenland. He's faking upstairs.' "'Yes. He's a sortin' the wipes. Up with you.' The candle was drawn back, and the face disappeared. Oliver, groping his way with one hand, and having the other firmly grasped by his companion, ascended with much difficulty the dark and broken stairs, which his conductor mounted with an ease and expedition that showed he was well acquainted with them. He threw open the door of a back room, and drew Oliver in after him. The walls and ceiling of the room were perfectly black with age and dirt. There was a deal-table before the fire, upon which were a candle stuck in a ginger-beer-bottle, two or three pewter pots, a loaf and butter, and a plate. In a frying-pan which was on the fire, and which was secured to the mantel-shelf by a string, some sausages were cooking, and standing over them, with a toasting-fork in his hand, was a very old shrivelled Jew, whose villainous-looking and repulsive face was obscured by a quantity of matted red hair. He was dressed in a greasy flannel gown, with his throat bare, and seemed to be dividing his attention between the frying-pan and the clothes-horse, over which a great number of silk handkerchiefs were hanging. Several rough beds, made of old sacks, were huddled side by side on the floor. Seated round the table were four or five boys, none older than the Dodger, smoking long clay pipes, and drinking spirits with the air of middle-aged men. These all crowded about their associate as he whispered a few words to the Jew, and then turned round and grinned at Oliver. So did the Jew himself, toasting fork in hand. "'This is him, Fagin,' said Jack Dawkins. "'My friend, Oliver Twist.' The Jew grinned, and, making a low obeisance to Oliver, took him by the hand, and hoped he should have the honour of his intimate acquaintance. Upon this, the young gentleman with the pipes came round him, and shook both his hands very hard, especially the one in which he held his little bundle. One young gentleman was very anxious to hang up his cap for him, and another was so obliging as to put his hands in his pockets, in order that, as he was very tired, he might not have the trouble of emptying them himself when he went to bed. These civilities would probably be extended much further, but for a liberal exercise of the Jew's toasting-fork on the heads and shoulders of the affectionate youths who offered them. "'We are very glad to see you, Oliver, very,' said the Jew. "'Dodger, take off the sausages, and draw a tub near the fire for Oliver. Ah, you're a-staring at the pocket handkerchiefs, eh, my dear?' "'There are a good many of them, ain't there? "'We've just looked him out, ready for the wash. "'That's all, Oliver, that's all.' <laughs> The latter part of his speech was hailed by a boisterous shout from all the hopeful pupils of the merry old gentleman, in the midst of which they went to supper. Oliver ate his share, and the Jew then mixed him a glass of hot gin and water telling him he must drink it off directly, because another gentleman wanted the tumbler. Oliver did as he was desired. Immediately afterwards he felt himself gently lifted onto one of the sacks, and then he sunk into a deep sleep.
Chapter Nine of Oliver Twist, containing further particulars concerning the pleasant old gentleman and his hopeful pupils. It was late next morning when Oliver awoke from a sound, long sleep. There was no other person in the room but the old Jew, who was boiling some coffee in a saucepan for breakfast, and whistling softly to himself as he stirred it round and round with an iron spoon. He would stop every now and then to listen when there was the least noise below, and when he had satisfied himself he would go on whistling and stirring again as before. Although Oliver had roused himself from sleep, he was not thoroughly awake. There is a drowsy state, between sleeping and waking, when you dream more in five minutes with your eyes half open, and yourself half conscious of everything that is passing around you, than you would in five nights with your eyes fast closed, and your senses wrapped in perfect unconsciousness. At such time, a mortal knows just enough of what his mind is doing, to form some glimmering conception of its mighty powers, its bounding from earth and spurning time and space, when freed from the restraint of its corporeal associate. Oliver was precisely in this condition. He saw the Jew with his half-closed eyes, heard his low whistling, and recognised the sound of the spoon grating against the saucepan's sides. And yet the self-same senses were mentally engaged at the same time in busy action with almost everybody he had ever known. When the coffee was done, the Jew drew the saucepan to the hob. Standing then in an irresolute attitude for a few minutes, as if he did not well know how to employ himself, he turned round and looked at Oliver, and called him by his name. He did not answer, and was to all appearances asleep. After satisfying himself upon this head, the Jew stepped gently to the door, which he fastened. He then drew forth, as it seemed to Oliver, from some trap in the floor, a small box which he placed carefully on the table. His eyes glistened as he raised the lid and looked in. Dragging an old chair to the table, he sat down, and took from it a magnificent gold watch, sparkling with jewels. Aha! said the Jew, shrugging up his shoulders and distorting every feature with a hideous grin. Clever dogs! Clever dogs! Staunch to the last! Never told the old parson where they were, never poached upon old Fagin, and why should they? It wouldn't have loosened the knot, or kept the drop up a minute longer. No, 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 fine fellows, fine fellows. With these, and other muttered reflections of the like nature, the Jew once more deposited the watch in its place of safety. At least half a dozen more were severally drawn forth from the same box, and surveyed with equal pleasure. Besides rings, brooches, bracelets, and other articles of jewellery, of such magnificent materials and costly workmanship, that Oliver had no idea even of their names. Having replaced these trinkets, the Jew took out another, so small that it lay in the palm of his hand. There seemed to be some very minute inscription on it, for the Jew laid it flat upon the table, and shading it with his hand, pored over it, long and earnestly. At length he put it down as if despairing of success, and, leaning back in his chair, muttered, "'What a fine thing capital punishment is! Dead men never repent! Dead men never bring awkward stories to light! Ah! It's a fine thing for the trade! Five of em strung up in a row, and none left to play booty, or turn white-livered!' As the Jew uttered these words, his bright dark eyes, which had been staring vacantly before him, fell on Oliver's face. The boy's eyes were fixed on his in mute curiosity. And although the recognition was only for an instant, for the briefest space of time that can possibly be conceived, it was enough to show the old man that he had been observed. He closed the lid of the box with a loud crash, and, laying his hand on a bread-knife which was on the table, started furiously up. He trembled very much, though for even in his terror Oliver could see that the knife quivered in the air. "'What's that?' said the Jew. "'What do you watch me for? Why are you awake? What have you seen? Speak out, boy, quick, quick, for your life!' "'I wasn't able to sleep any longer, sir,' 
replied Oliver meekly. "'I'm very sorry if I have disturbed you, sir.' "'You were not awake an hour ago,' said the Jew, scowling fiercely on the boy. "'No, no, indeed,' replied Oliver. "'Are you sure?' cried the Jew, with a still fiercer look than before, and a threatening attitude. "'Upon my words, I was not, sir,' replied Oliver earnestly. "'I was not, indeed, sir.' "'Tush, tush, my dear,' said the Jew, abruptly resuming his old manner, and playing with the knife a little, before he laid it down, as if to induce the belief that he had caught it up in mere sport. "'Of course I know that, my dear. I only try to frighten you. You're a brave boy. <laughs> You're a brave boy, Oliver.' The Jew rubbed his hands with a chuckle, but glanced uneasily at the box, notwithstanding. "'Did you see any of these pretty things, my dear?' said the Jew, laying his hand upon it after a short pause. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Ah!' said the Jew, turning rather pale. "'They—they're mine, Oliver. My little property. All I have to live upon in my old age. The folks call me a miser, my dear. Only a miser. That's all." Oliver thought the old gentleman must be a decided miser, to live in such a dirty place with so many watches. But thinking that perhaps his fondness for the Dodger and the other boys cost him a good deal of money, he only cast a deferential look at the Jew, and asked if he might get up. "'Certainly, my dear, certainly replied the old gentleman. "'Stay. There's a pitcher of water in the corner by the door. Bring it here, and I'll give you a basin to wash in, my dear.' Oliver got up, walked across the room, and stooped for an instant to raise the pitcher. When he turned his head, the box was gone. He had scarcely washed himself, and made everything tidy, by emptying the basin out of the window, agreeably to the Jew's directions when the Dodger returned, accompanied by a very sprightly young friend, whom Oliver had seen smoking on the previous night, and who was now formally introduced to him as Charlie Bates. The four sat down to breakfast on the coffee, and some hot rolls, and ham, which the Dodger had brought home in the crown of his hat. "'Well,' said the Jew, glancing slyly at Oliver, and addressing himself to the Dodger, "'I hope you've been at work this morning, my dears.' Odd, replied the Dodger. "'As nails,' added Charlie Bates. "'Good boys, good boys,' said the Jew. "'What have you got, Dodger?' "'A couple of pocket-books,' replied that young gentleman. "'Lined?' inquired the Jew, with eagerness. "'Pretty well,' replied the Dodger, producing two pocket-books, one green and the other red. "'Not so heavy as they might be.' said the Jew, after looking at the insides carefully. "'But very neat and nicely made. Ingenious workman, ain't he, Oliver?' "'Very indeed, sir,' said Oliver, at which Mr. Charles Bates laughed uproariously, very much to the amazement of Oliver, who saw nothing to laugh at in anything that had passed. "'And what have you got, my dear?' said Fagin to Charlie Bates. "'Wipes.' replied Master Bates, at the same time producing four pocket-handkerchiefs. "'Well,' said the Jew, inspecting them closely, "'they're very good ones, very. You haven't marked them well, though, Charlie. So the marks shall be picked out with a needle, and we'll teach Oliver how to do it. Shall us, Oliver, eh?' <laughs> "'If you please, sir,' said Oliver. You'd like to be able to make pocket-handkerchiefs as easy as Charlie Bates, wouldn't you, my dear?" said the Jew. "'Very much indeed, if you'll teach me, sir,' replied Oliver. Master Bates saw something so exquisitely ludicrous in this reply, that he burst into another laugh, which laugh, meeting the coffee he was drinking, and carrying it down some wrong channel, very nearly terminated in his premature suffocation. <laughs> so jolly green," said Charlie, when he recovered, 
as an apology to the company for his unpolite behaviour. The Dodger said nothing, but he smoothed Oliver's hair over his eyes, and said he'd know better by and by, upon which the old gentleman, observing Oliver's colour mounting, changed the subject by asking whether there had been much of a crowd at the execution that morning. This made him wonder more and more, for it was plain from the replies of the two boys that they had both been there, and Oliver naturally wondered how they could possibly have found time to be so very industrious. When the breakfast was cleared away, the merry old gentleman and the two boys played at a very curious and uncommon game, which was performed in this way. The merry old gentleman placed a snuff-box in one pocket of his trousers, a note-case in the other, and a watch in his waistcoat pocket, with a guard-chain around his neck, and sticking a mock diamond pin in his shirt, buttoned his coat tightly round him, and putting a spectacle-case and handkerchief in his pockets, trotted up and down the room with a stick, in imitation of the manner in which old gentlemen walk about the streets any hour in that day. Sometimes he stopped at the fireplace, and sometimes at the door, making believe that he was staring with all his might into shop windows. At such times he would look constantly round him, for fear of thieves, and would keep slapping all his pockets in turn, to see that he hadn't lost anything, in such a very funny and natural manner, that Oliver laughed till the tears ran down his face. All this time the two boys followed him closely about, getting out of his sight so nimbly every time he turned round, that it was impossible to follow their motions. At last the Dodger trod upon his toes, or ran upon his boot accidentally, while Charlie Bates stumbled up against him behind, and in that one moment they took from him, with the most extraordinary rapidity, snuff-box, note-case, watch-guard, chain, shirt-pin, pocket-handkerchief, even the spectacle-case. If the old gentleman felt a hand in any one of his pockets, he cried out where it was, and then the game began all over again. When this game had been played a great many times, a couple of young ladies called to see the young gentleman, one of whom was named Bet, and the other Nancy. They wore a good deal of hair, not very neatly turned up behind, and were rather untidy about the shoes and stockings. They were not exactly pretty, perhaps, but they had a great deal of colour in their faces, and looked quite stout and hearty. Being remarkably free and agreeable in their manners, Oliver thought them very nice girls indeed as there is no doubt they were. The visitors stopped a long time. Spirits were produced, in consequence of one of the young ladies complaining of a coldness in her inside, and the conversation took a very convivial and improving turn. At length Charlie Bates expressed his opinion that it was time to pad the hoof. This, it occurred to Oliver, must be French for going out, for directly afterwards the Dodger and Charlie and the two young ladies went away together having been kindly furnished by the amiable old Jew, with money to spend. "'There, my dear,' said Fagin, "'that's a pleasant life, isn't it? They've gone out for the day.' "'Have they done work, sir?' inquired Oliver. "'Yes,' said the Jew. "'That is, unless they should unexpectedly come across any when they're out.' "'And they won't neglect it if they do, my dear, depend upon it. "'Make em your models, my dear. Make em your models,' "'tapping the fire-shovel on the hearth to add force to his words. "'Do everything they bid you, and take their advice in all matters, "'especially the Dodgers, my dear. "'He'll be a great man himself, and will make you one, too, "'if you take pattern by him. "'Is my handkerchief hanging out of my pocket, my dear?' said the Jew, stopping short. "'Yes, sir,' said Oliver. "'See if you can take it out without my feeling it, as you saw them do when we were at play this morning.' Oliver held up the bottom of the pocket with one hand, as he had seen the Dodger hold it, and drew the handkerchief lightly out of it with the other. "'Is it gone?' cried the Jew. "'Here it is, sir,' said Oliver, showing it in his hand. "'You're a clever boy, my dear,' said the playful old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head approvingly. "'I never saw a sharper lad. Here's a shilling for you. If you go on in this way, 
you be the greatest man of the time. And now, come here, and I'll show you how to take the marks out of the handkerchiefs." Oliver wondered what picking the old gentleman's pocket in play had to do with his chances of being a great man, but, thinking that the Jew, being so much his senior, must know best, he followed him quietly to the table, and was soon deeply involved in his new study. CHAPTER Ten. Oliver becomes better acquainted with the characters of his new associates, and purchases experience at a high price, being a short but very important chapter in this history. For many days Oliver remained in the Jew's room, picking the marks out of the pocket-handkerchief, of which a great number were brought home, and sometimes taking part in the game already described, which the two boys and the Jew played regularly every morning. At length, he began to languish for fresh air, and took many occasions of earnestly entreating the old gentleman to allow him to go out to work with his two companions. Oliver was rendered the more anxious to be actively employed by what he had seen of the stern morality of the old gentleman's character. Whenever the Dodger or Charlie Bates came home at night, empty-handed, he would expatiate with great vehemence on the misery of idle and lazy habits, and would enforce upon them the necessity of an active life by sending them supperless to bed. On one occasion, indeed, he even went so far as to knock them both down a flight of stairs, but this was carrying out his virtuous precepts to an unusual extent. At length, one morning, Oliver obtained the permission he had so eagerly sought. There had been no handkerchiefs to work upon for two or three days, and the dinners had been rather meagre. Perhaps these were reasons for the old gentleman's giving his assent. But, whether they were or no, he told Oliver he might go, and placed him under the joint guardianship of Charlie Bates and his friend the Dodger. The three boys sallied out, the Dodger with his coat-sleeves tucked up, and his hat cocked as usual, Master Bates sauntering along with his hands in his pockets, and Oliver between them, wondering where they were going, and what branch of manufacture he would be instructed in first. The pace at which they went was such a very lazy, ill-looking saunter, that Oliver soon began to think his companions were going to deceive the old gentleman by not going to work at all. The Dodger had a vicious propensity, too, of pulling the caps from the heads of small boys, and tossing them down areas, while Charlie Bates exhibited some very loose notions concerning the rights of property, by pilfering diverse apples and onions from the stalls at the kennel sides, and thrusting them into pockets which were so surprisingly capacious that they seemed to undermine his whole suit of clothes in every direction. These things looked so bad that Oliver was on the point of declaring his intention of seeking his way back, in the best way he could, when his thoughts were suddenly directed into another channel, by a very mysterious change of behaviour on the part of the Dodger. They were just emerging from a narrow court not far from the open square in Clerkenwell, which is yet called, by some strange perversion of terms, the Green, when the Dodger made a sudden stop, and, laying his finger on his lip, drew his companions back again with the greatest caution and circumspection. "'What's the matter?' demanded Oliver. "'Hush!' replied the Dodger. "'You see that old cove at the bookstall? "'The old gentleman over the way,' said Oliver. "'Yes, I see him.' "'He'll do,' said the Dodger. "'A prime plant,' observed Master Charlie Bates. Oliver looked from one to the other, with the greatest surprise, but he was not permitted to make any inquiries for the two boys walked stealthily across the road, and slunk close behind the old gentleman, towards whom his attention had been directed. Oliver walked a few paces after them, and, not knowing whether to advance or retire, stood looking on in silent amazement. The old gentleman was a very respectable-looking personage, with a powdered head and gold spectacles. He was dressed in a bottle-green coat, with a black velvet collar, wore white trousers, and carried a smart bamboo cane under his arm. He had taken up a book from the stall, and there he stood, reading away, as hard as if he were in his elbow-chair in his own study. It is very possible that he fancied himself there indeed, for it was plain from his abstraction that he saw not the book-stall, nor the street, nor the boys, nor, in short, anything but the book itself, which he was reading straight through, turning over the leaf when he got to the bottom of a page, 
beginning at the top line of the next one, and going regularly on with the greatest interest and eagerness. What was Oliver's horror and alarm, as he stood a few paces off, looking on with his eyelids as wide open as they would possibly go, to see the dodger plunge his hand into the old gentleman's pocket, and draw from thence a handkerchief, to see him hand the same to Charlie Bates, and finally to behold them both running away round the corner at full speed. In an instant, the whole mystery of the handkerchiefs, and the watches, and the jewels, and the Jew, rushed upon the boy's mind. He stood, for a moment, with the blood so tingling through all his veins from terror, that he felt as if he were in a burning fire. Then, confused and frightened, he took to his heels, and, not knowing what he did, made off as fast as he could lay his feet to the ground. This was all done in a minute's space. In the very instant when Oliver began to run, the old gentleman, putting his hand to his pocket, and missing his handkerchief, turned sharply round. Seeing the boy scudding away at such a rapid pace, he very naturally concluded him to be the depredator, and shouting, STOP THIEF! with all his might, made off after him, book in hand. But the old gentleman was not the only person who raised the hue and cry. The Dodger and Master Bates, unwilling to attract public attention by running down the open street, had merely retired into the very first doorway round the corner. They no sooner heard the cry, and saw Oliver running, than, guessing exactly how the matter stood, they issued forth with great promptitude, and shouting, STOP THIEF! too, joined in the pursuit like good citizens. Although Oliver had been brought up by philosophers, he was not theoretically acquainted with the beautiful axiom that self-preservation is the first law of nature. If he had been, perhaps he would have been prepared for this. Not being prepared, however, it alarmed him the more. So away he went like the wind, with the old gentleman and the two boys roaring and shouting behind him. STOP THIEF! STOP THIEF! There is a magic in the sound. The tradesman leaves his counter, and the carman his wagon, the butcher throws down his tray, the baker his basket, the milkman his pail, the errand boy his parcels, the schoolboy his marbles, the pavior his pickaxe, the child his battledore. Away they run, pell-mell, helter-skelter, slap-dash, tearing, yelling, screaming, knocking down the passengers as they turn the corners, rousing up the dogs, and astonishing the fowls, and streets, squares, and courts re-echo with the sound. Stop thief! Stop thief! The cry is taken up by a hundred voices, and the crowd accumulate at every turning. Away they fly, splashing through the mud and rattling along the pavements. Up go the windows, out run the people, onward bear the mob, a whole audience desert punch in the very thickest of the plot, and, joining the rushing throng, swell the shout, and lend fresh vigour to the cry, STOP THIEF! STOP THIEF! STOP THIEF! STOP THIEF! There is a passion for hunting, something deeply implanted in the human breast. One wretched, breathless child, panting with exhaustion, terror in his looks, agony in his eyes, large drops of perspiration streaming down his face, strains every nerve to make head upon his pursuers, and as they follow on his track, and gain upon him every instant, they hail his decreasing strength with joy. STOP THIEF! Aye, stop him for God's sake, were it only in mercy. Stopped at last, a clever blow. He is down upon the pavement, and the crowd eagerly gather round him, each newcomer jostling and struggling with the others to catch a glimpse. Stand aside! Give him a little air! Nonsense! He don't deserve it! Where's the gentleman? Here he is, coming down the street! Make room there for the gentleman. Is this the boy, sir? Yes. Oliver lay covered with mud and dust, and bleeding from the mouth, looking wildly round upon the heap of faces that surrounded him, when the old gentleman was officiously dragged and pushed into the circle by the foremost of the pursuers. Yes, said the gentleman, I'm afraid it is the boy. Afraid? murmured the crowd. That's a good un. Poor fellow, said the gentleman, he has hurt himself. I did that, sir, said a great lubberly fellow, stepping forward, and preciously I cut my knuckle again his mouth. I stopped him, sir. The fellow touched his hat with a grin, expecting something for his pains. But the old gentleman, eyeing him with an expression of dislike, 
look anxiously round, as if he contemplated running away himself, which it is very possible he might have attempted to do, and thus have afforded another chase, had not a police officer, who is generally the last person to arrive in such cases, at that moment made his way through the crowd, and seized Oliver by the collar. "'Come, get up!' said the man roughly. "'It wasn't me, indeed, sir, indeed, indeed. It was two other boys,' said Oliver, clasping his hands passionately and looking round. "'They are, they are here somewhere.' "'Oh, no, they ain't,' said the officer. He meant this to be ironical, but it was true besides, for the Dodger and Charlie Bates had filed off down the first convenient court they came to. "'Come, get up!' "'Don't hurt him,' said the old gentleman compassionately. "'Oh, no, I won't hurt him,' replied the officer, tearing his jacket half off his back in proof thereof. "'Come, I know you. It won't do. Will you stand upon your legs, you young devil?' Oliver, who could hardly stand, made a shift to raise himself on his feet, and was at once lugged along the streets by the jacket-collar at a rapid pace. The gentleman walked on with them by the officer's side, and as many of the crowd as could achieve the feat got a little ahead and stared back at Oliver from time to time. The boys shouted in triumph, and on they went. CHAPTER Eleven. Treats of Mr. Fang, the police magistrate, and furnishes a slight specimen of his mode of administering justice. The offence had been committed within the district, and indeed in the immediate neighbourhood of a very notorious metropolitan police office. The crowd had only the satisfaction of accompanying Oliver through two or three streets, and down a place called Mutton Hill, when he was led beneath a low archway, and up a dirty court, into this dispensary of summary justice by the back way. It was a small paved yard, into which they turned, and here they encountered a stout man with a bunch of whiskers on his face, and a bunch of keys in his hand. "'What's the matter now?' said the man carelessly. "'A young fogle hunter replied the man who had Oliver in charge. "'Are you the party that's been robbed, sir?' inquired the man with the keys. "'Yes, I am,' replied the old gentleman. "'But I am not sure that this boy actually took the handkerchief. I—I I would rather not press the case.' "'Must go before the magistrate now, sir,' replied the man. "'His worship will be disengaged in half a minute. Now, young gallows.' This was an invitation for Oliver to enter through a door which he unlocked as he spoke, and which led into a stone cell. Here he was searched, and nothing being found upon him, locked up. This cell was in shape and size something like an area cellar, only not so light. It was most intolerably dirty, for it was Monday morning, and it had been tenanted by six drunken people who had been locked up elsewhere since Saturday night. But this is little. In our station houses, men and women, are every night confined on the most trivial charges. The word is worth noting. In dungeons, compared with which those in Newgate, occupied by the most atrocious felons, tried, found guilty, and under sentence of death, are palaces. Let any one who doubts this compare the two. The old gentleman looked almost as rueful as Oliver when the key grated in the lock. He turned with the sigh to the book which had been the innocent cause of all this disturbance. "'There is something in that boy's face,' said the old gentleman to himself as he walked slowly away, tapping his chin with the cover of the book in a thoughtful manner, "'something that touches and interests me. Can he be innocent? He, he looked like—by the by,' exclaimed the old gentleman, halting very abruptly and staring up into the sky. "'Bless my soul! Where have I seen something like that look before?' After musing for some minutes, the old gentleman walked, with the same meditative face, into a back ante-room opening from the yard, and there retiring into a corner, called up before his mind's eye a vast amphitheatre of faces, over which a dusky curtain had hung for many years. "'No,' said the old gentleman, shaking his head, 
"'It must be imagination.' He wandered over them again. He had called them into view, and it was not easy to replace the shroud that had so long concealed them. There were the faces of friends and foes, and of many that had been almost strangers, peering intrusively from the crowd. There were the faces of young and blooming girls that were now old women. There were faces that the grave had changed and closed upon, but which the mind, superior to its power, still dressed in their old freshness and beauty, calling back the lustre of the eyes, the brightness of the smile, the beaming of the soul through its mask of clay, and whispering of beauty beyond the tomb, changed but to be heightened, and taken from earth only to be set up as a light, to shed a soft and gentle glow upon the path to heaven. But the old gentleman could recall no one countenance of which Oliver's features bore a trace. So he heaved a sigh over the recollections he awakened, and being, happily for himself, an absent old gentleman, buried them again in the pages of the musty book. He was roused by a touch on the shoulder, and a request from the man with the keys to follow him into the office. He closed his book hastily, and was at once ushered into the imposing presence of the renowned Mr. Fang. The office was a front parlour, with a panelled wall. Mr. Fang sat behind a bar at the upper end, and on one side the door was a sort of wooden pen, in which poor little Oliver was already deposited, trembling very much at the awfulness of the scene. Mr. Fang was a lean, long-backed, stiff-necked, middle-sized man, with no great quantity of hair, and what he had growing on the back and sides of his head. His face was stern and much flushed. If he were really not in the habit of drinking, rather more than was exactly good for him, he might have brought action against his countenance for libel, and have recovered heavy damages. The old gentleman bowed respectfully, and advancing to the magistrate's desk, said, suiting the action to the word, "'That is my name and address, sir.' He then withdrew a pace or two, and, with another polite and gentlemanly inclination of the head, waited to be questioned. Now it so happened that Mr. Fang was at that moment perusing a leading article in a newspaper of the morning, adverting to some recent decision of his, and commending him, for the three hundred and fiftieth time, to the special and particular notice of the Secretary of State for the Home Department. He was out of temper, and he looked up with an angry scowl. "'Who are you?' said Mr. Fang. The old gentleman pointed, with some surprise, to his card. "'Officer,' said Mr. Fang, tossing the card contemptuously away with the newspaper, "'who is this fellow?' "'My name, sir,' said the old gentleman, speaking like a gentleman. "'My name, sir, is Brownlow.' Permit me to inquire the name of the magistrate who offers a gratuitous and unprovoked insult to a respectable person under the protection of the bench." Saying this, Mr. Brownlow looked around the office, as if in search of some person who would afford him the required information. "'Officer!' said Mr. Fang, throwing the paper on one side. "'What's this fellow charged with?' "'He's not charged at all, Your Worship.' replied the officer. He appears against this boy, your worship." His worship knew this perfectly well, but it was a good annoyance, and a safe one. "'Appears against the boy, does he?' said Mr. Fang, surveying Mr. Brownlow contemptuously from head to foot. "'Swear him. Before I'm sworn, I must beg to say one word,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'and that is, that I really never, without actual experience, could have believed— "'Hold your tongue, sir,' said Mr. Fang peremptorily. "'I will not, sir,' replied the old gentleman. "'Hold your tongue this instant, or I'll have you turned out of the office,' said Mr. Fang. "'You're an insolent, impertinent fellow. How dare you bully a magistrate!' "'What?' exclaimed the old gentleman, reddening. "'Swear this person,' said Fang to the clerk. "'I'll not hear another word. Swear him.' Mr. Brownlow's indignation was greatly roused, but reflecting, perhaps, that he might only injure the boy by giving vent to it, he suppressed his feelings, and submitted to be sworn at once. "'Now,' 
said Fang. "'What's the charge against this boy? What have you got to say, sir?' "'I was standing at a bookstall,' Mr. Brownlow began. "'Hold your tongue, sir,' said Mr. Fang. "'Policeman? Where's the policeman? Here, yeah. swear this policeman. Now, policeman, what is this?' The policeman, with becoming humility, related how he had taken the charge, how he had searched Oliver, and found nothing on his person, and how that was all he knew about it. "'Are there any witnesses?' inquired Mr. Fang. "'None, your worship,' replied the policeman. Mr. Fang sat silent for some minutes, and then, turning round to the prosecutor, said in a towering passion, "'Do you mean to state what your complaint against this boy is, man, or do you not? You have been sworn. Now, if you stand there, refusing to give evidence, I'll punish you for disrespect to the bench. I will by—' By what, or by whom, nobody knows. For the clerk and jailer coughed very loud, just at the right moment, and the former dropped a heavy book upon the floor, thus preventing the word from being heard, accidentally, of course. With many interruptions and repeated insults, Mr. Brownlow contrived to state his case, observing that, in the surprise of the moment, he had run after the boy, because he saw him running away, and expressing his hope that, if the magistrate should believe him, although not actually the thief, to be connected with the thieves, he would deal as leniently with him as justice would allow. "'He has been hurt already,' said the old gentleman in conclusion, and I fear, he added with great energy, looking towards the bar, I really fear that he is ill. Oh, yes, I dare say, said Mr. Fang with a sneer. Come, none of your tricks here, you young vagabond. They won't do. What's your name? Oliver tried to reply, but his tongue failed him. He was deadly pale, and the whole place seemed turning round and round. "'What's your name, you hardened scoundrel?' demanded Mr. Fang. "'Officer, what's his name?' This was addressed to a bluff old fellow in a striped waistcoat, who was standing by the bar. He bent over Oliver, and repeated the inquiry, but finding him really incapable of understanding the question, and knowing that his not replying would only infuriate the magistrate the more, and add to the severity of his sentence, he hazarded a guess. "'He says his name's Tom White, your worship,' said the kind-hearted thief-taker. "'No. Oh, he won't speak out, won't he?' said Fang. "'Very well. Very well. Where does he live?' "'Where he can, your worship,' replied the officer, again pretending to receive Oliver's answer. "'Has he any parents?' inquired Mr. Fang. "'He says they died in his infancy, your worship,' replied the officer hazarding the usual reply. At this point of the inquiry, Oliver raised his head, and, looking round with imploring eyes, murmured a feeble prayer for a draught of water. "'Stuff and nonsense!' said Mr. Fang. "'Don't try to make a fool of me!' "'I think he really is ill, your worship,' remonstrated the officer. "'I know better,' said Mr. Fang. "'Take care of him, officer.' said the old gentleman, raising his hands instinctively. "'He'll fall down.' "'Stand away, officer,' cried Fang. "'Let him, if he likes.' Oliver availed himself of the kind permission, and fell to the floor in a fainting fit. The men in the office looked at each other, but no one dared to stir. "'I knew he was shamming,' said Fang, as if this were incontestable proof of the fact. "'Let him lie there.' He'll soon be tired of that. "'How do you propose to deal with the case, sir?' inquired the clerk, in a low voice. "'Summarily,' replied Mr. Fang. "'He stands committed for three months. Hard labour, of course. Clear the office.' The door was opened for this purpose, and a couple of men were preparing to carry the insensible boy to his cell, when an elderly man of decent but poor appearance, clad in an old suit of black, rushed hastily into the office, and advanced towards the bench. Oh, "'Stop! Stop! Don't take him away! For heaven's sake, stop a moment!' cried the newcomer, breathless with haste. 
Although the presiding genii in such an office as this, exercise a summary and arbitrary power over the liberties, the good name, the character, almost the lives, of Her Majesty's subjects, especially of the poorer class. And although within such walls enough fantastic tricks are daily played to make the angels blind with weeping, they are closed to the public, save through the medium of the daily press. Footnote, or were virtually then. Mr. Fang was consequently not a little indignant to see an unbidden guest enter in such irreverent disorder. "'What is this? Who is this? Turn this man out! Clear the office!' cried Mr. Fang. "'I will speak!' cried the man. "'I will not be turned out. I saw it all. I keep the bookstore. I demand to be sworn. I will not be put down. Mr. Fang, you must hear me. You must not refuse, sir." The man was right. His manner was determined, and the matter was growing rather too serious to be hushed up. "'Swear the man!' growled Mr. Fang, with a very ill grace. "'Now, man, what have you got to say?' "'This,' said the man. "'I saw three boys, two others, and the prisoner here, loitering on the opposite side of the way, when this gentleman was reading. The robbery was committed by another boy. I saw it done, and I saw that this boy was perfectly amazed and stupefied by it." Having by this time recovered a little breath, the worthy bookstall-keeper proceeded to relate, in a more coherent manner, the exact circumstances of the robbery. "'Why didn't you come here before?' said Fang, after a pause. "'I hadn't a soul to mind the shop.' replied the man. Everybody who could have helped me had joined in the pursuit. I could get nobody till five minutes ago, and I've run here all the way." "'The prosecutor was reading, was he?' inquired Fang, after another pause. "'Yes,' replied the man. "'The very book he has in his hand.' "'Oh, that book, eh?' said Fang. "'Is it paid for?' "'No, it is not,' replied the man, with a smile. "'Dear me! I forgot all about it!' exclaimed the absent old gentleman innocently. "'A nice person to prefer a charge against a poor boy,' said Fang, with a comical effort to look humane. "'I consider, sir, that you have obtained possession of that book, under very suspicious and disreputable circumstances, and you may think yourself very fortunate that the owner of the property declines to prosecute.' Let this be a lesson to you, my man, or the law will overtake you yet. The boy is discharged. Clear the office." "'Damn me!' cried the old gentleman, bursting out with the rage he had kept down so long. "'Damn me! I'll—' "'Clear the office,' said the magistrate. "'Officers, do you hear? Clear the office!' The mandate was obeyed, and the indignant Mr. Brownlow was conveyed out, with the book in one hand and the bamboo cane in the other, in a perfect frenzy of rage and defiance. He reached the yard, and his passion vanished in a moment. Little Oliver Twist lay on his back on the pavement, with his shirt unbuttoned, and his temples bathed with water, his face a deadly white, and a cold tremble convulsing his whole frame. "'Poor boy! Poor boy!' said Mr. Brownlow, bending over him. "'Call a coach, somebody, pray, directly!' A coach was obtained, and Oliver having been carefully laid on the seat, the old gentleman got in, and sat himself on the other. "'May I accompany you?' said the bookstall-keeper, looking in. "'Bless me, yes, my dear sir,' said Mr. Brownlow, quickly. "'I forgot you. "'Dear, dear, I have this unhappy book still. <laughs> "'Jump in. Poor fellow, there's no time to lose.' The bookstall-keeper got into the coach, and away they drove. CHAPTER Twelve, IN WHICH OLIVER IS TAKEN BETTER CARE OF THAN HE EVER WAS BEFORE, AND IN WHICH THE NARRATIVE REVERTS TO THE MERRY OLD GENTLEMAN AND HIS YOUTHFUL FRIENDS. The coach rattled away, over nearly the same ground as that which Oliver had traversed when he first entered London, in company with the Dodger, and, turning a different way when it reached the Angel at Islington, 
stopped at length before a neat house in a quiet shady street near Pentonville. Here a bed was prepared, without loss of time, in which Mr. Brownlow saw his young charge carefully and comfortably deposited, and here he was tended with a kindness and solicitude that knew no bounds. But for many days Oliver remained insensible to all the goodness of his new friends. The sun rose and sank, and rose and sank again, and many times after that, and still the boy lay stretched on his uneasy bed, dwindling away beneath the dry and wasting heat of fever. The worm does not work more surely on the dead body, than does this slow creeping fire upon the living frame. Weak and thin and pallid, he awoke at last, from what seemed to have been a long and troubled dream. Feebly raising himself in the bed, with his head resting on his trembling arm, he looked anxiously around. "'What room is this? Where have I been brought to?' said Oliver. "'This is not the place I went to sleep in.' He uttered these words in a feeble voice, being very faint and weak, but they were overheard at once. The curtain at the bed's head was hastily drawn back, and a motherly old lady, very neatly and precisely dressed, rose as she undrew it from an armchair close by, in which she had been sitting at needlework. "'Hush, my dear,' said the old lady softly. "'You must be very quiet, or you'll be ill again, and you've been very bad, as bad as bad could be, pretty nigh. Lie down again, there's a dear.' With those words, the old lady very gently placed Oliver's head upon the pillow, and, smoothing back his hair from his forehead, looked so kindly and loving in his face, that he could not help placing his little withered hand in hers, and drawing it round his neck. "'Save us!' said the old lady, with tears in her eyes. "'What a grateful little dear it is! Pretty creature! What would his mother feel if she had sat by him as I have, and could see him now?' "'Perhaps she does see me,' whispered Oliver, folding his hands together. "'Perhaps she has sat by me. I almost feel as if she had.' "'That was the fever, my dear,' said the old lady mildly. "'I suppose it was,' replied Oliver, "'because heaven is a long way off.' and they are too happy there to come down to the bedside of a poor boy. But if she knew I was ill, she must have pitied me even there, for she was very ill herself before she died. She can't know anything about me, though," added Oliver, after a moment's silence, if she had seen me hurt, it would have made her sorrowful and her face has always looked sweet and happy when I have dreamed of her." The old lady made no reply to this, but wiping her eyes first, and her spectacles, which lay on the counterpane afterwards, as if they were part and parcel of those features, brought some cool stuff for Oliver to drink, and then, patting him on the cheek, told him he must lie very quiet, or he would be ill again. So. Oliver kept very still, partly because he was anxious to obey the kind old lady in all things, and partly, to tell the truth, because he was completely exhausted with what he had already said. He soon fell into a gentle doze, from which he was awakened by the light of a candle, which, being brought near the bed, showed him a gentleman with a very large and loud ticking gold watch in his hand, who felt his pulse, and said he was a great deal better. "'You are her a great deal better, are you not, my dear?' said the gentleman. "'Yes, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Yes, I know you are,' said the gentleman. "'You're hungry, too, aren't you?' "'No, sir,' answered Oliver. <clears throat> said the gentleman. "'No, I know you're not. He is not hungry, Mrs. Bedwin,' said the gentleman, looking very wise. The old lady made a respectful inclination of the head which seemed to say that she thought the doctor was a very clever man. The doctor appeared much of the same opinion himself. Uh, "'You feel sleepy, don't you, my dear?' said the doctor. "'No, sir,' replied Oliver. "'No?' 
said the doctor, with a very shrewd and satisfied look. "'You're not sleepy, <laughs> nor thirsty, are you?' "'Oh, yes, sir. Rather thirsty,' answered Oliver. "'Just as I expected, Mrs. Bedwin,' said the doctor. "'It's very natural that he should be thirsty. You may give him a little tea, ma'am, and some dry toast without any butter. Don't keep him too warm, ma'am, but be careful that you don't let him be too cold. Will you have the goodness?' The old lady dropped a curtsy. The doctor, after tasting the cool stuff, and expressing a qualified approval of it, hurried away, his boots creaking in a very important and wealthy manner as he went downstairs. Oliver dozed off again soon after this. When he awoke, it was nearly twelve o'clock. The old lady tenderly bade him good-night shortly afterwards, and left him in charge of a fat old woman who had just come, bringing with her, in a little bundle, a small prayer-book and a large nightcap. Putting the latter on her head, and the former on the table, the old woman, after telling Oliver that she had come to sit up with him, drew her chair close to the fire, and went off into a series of short naps, checkered at frequent intervals with sundry tumblings forward, and diverse moans and chokings. These, however, had no worse effect than causing her to rub her nose very hard, and then fall asleep again. And thus the night crept slowly on. Oliver lay awake for some time, counting the little circles of light which the reflection of the rush-light shade threw upon the ceiling, or tracing with his languid eyes the intricate pattern of the paper on the wall. The darkness and the deep stillness of the room were very solemn, as they brought into the boy's mind the thought that death had been hovering there for many days and nights, and might yet fill it with the gloom and dread of his awful presence. He turned his face upon the pillow, and fervently prayed to heaven. Gradually he fell into that deep, tranquil sleep, which ease from recent suffering alone imparts, that calm and peaceful rest which it is pain to wake from. Who, if this were death, would be roused again to all the struggles and turmoils of life, to all its cares for the present, its anxieties for the future, more than all, its weary recollections of the past? It had been bright day for hours when Oliver opened his eyes. He felt cheerful and happy. The crisis of the disease was safely past. He belonged to the world again. In three days' time he was able to sit in an easy chair, well propped up with pillows, and, as he was still too weak to walk, Mrs. Bedwin had him carried downstairs into the little housekeeper's room, which belonged to her. Having him set here by the fireside, the good old lady sat herself down too and, being in a state of considerable delight at seeing him so much better, forthwith began to cry most violently. Oh, "'Never mind me, my dear,' said the old lady. "'I'm only having a, a regular good cry. There. It's, uh, it's all over now, and I'm quite comfortable.' "'You're very, very kind to me, ma'am,' said Oliver. "'Well, never you mind that, my dear.' said the old lady, that's got nothing to do with your broth, and it's full time you had it, for the doctor says Mr. Brownlow may come in to see you this morning, and we must get up our best looks, because the better we look, the more he'll be pleased. And with this, the old lady applied herself to warming up, in a little saucepan, a basin full of broth, strong enough, Oliver thought, to furnish an ample dinner, when reduced to the regulation strength for three hundred and fifty paupers at the lowest computation. "'Are you fond of pictures, dear?' inquired the old lady, seeing that Oliver had fixed his eyes most intently on a portrait which hung against the wall, just opposite his chair. "'I don't quite know, ma'am,' said Oliver, without taking his eyes from the canvas. "'I have seen so few that I hardly know. What a beautiful, mild face that lady's is!' "'Ah!' said the old lady. Painters always make ladies out prettier than they are, or they wouldn't get any custom, child. The man that invented the machine for taking likenesses might have known that would never succeed. It's a deal too honest. A deal," said the old lady, laughing very heartily at her own acuteness. "'Is, is that a likeness, ma'am?' said Oliver. "'Yes,' said the old lady, looking up for a moment from the broth. "'That's a portrait.' "'Whose, ma'am?' asked Oliver. "'Why, really, my dear, I don't know,' answered the old lady in a good-humoured manner. 
"'It's not a likeness of anybody that you or I know, I expect. "'It seems to strike your fancy, dear.' "'It is so pretty,' replied Oliver. "'Why, sure you're not afraid of it,' said the old lady, "'observing in great surprise the look of awe "'with which the child regarded the painting. "'Oh, no, no,' returned Oliver quickly. "'But the eyes look so sorrowful, "'and where I sit they seem fixed upon me. "'It makes my heart beat,' added Oliver, in a low voice, "'as if it was alive, and wanted to speak to me, but couldn't.' "'Lord save us!' exclaimed the old lady, starting. "'Don't talk in that way, child. "'You're weak and nervous after your illness. "'Let me wheel your chair round to the other side, "'and then you won't see it. "'There,' said the old lady, suiting the action to the word. "'You don't see it now, at all events.' Oliver did see it in his mind's eye, as distinctly as if he had not altered his position. But he thought it better not to worry the kind old lady, so he smiled gently when she looked at him, and Mrs. Bedwin, satisfied that he felt more comfortable, salted and broke bits of toasted bread into the broth, with all the bustle befitting so solemn a preparation. Oliver got through it with extraordinary expedition. He had scarcely swallowed the last spoonful, when there came a soft rap at the door. "'Come in,' said the old lady, and in walked Mr. Brownlow. Now the old gentleman came in as brisk as need be, but he had no sooner raised his spectacles on his forehead, and thrust his hands behind the skirts of his dressing-gown to take a good long look at Oliver, than his countenance underwent a very great variety of odd contortions. Oliver looked very worn and shadowy from sickness, and made an ineffectual attempt to stand up, out of respect to his benefactor, which terminated in his sinking back into the chair again. And the fact is, if the truth must be told, that Mr. Brownlow's heart, being large enough for any six ordinary old gentlemen of humane disposition, forced a supply of tears into his eyes by some hydraulic process which we are not sufficiently philosophical to be in a condition to explain. "'Poor boy! Poor boy!' <coughs> said Mr. Brownlow, clearing his throat. "'I'm rather hoarse this morning, Mrs. Bedwin. I'm afraid I've caught a cold.' "'I hope not, sir,' said Mrs. Bedwin. "'Everything you have had has been well aired, sir.' "'I don't know, Bedwin. I don't know,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'I rather think I had a damp napkin at dinner-time yesterday. But never mind that. How do you feel, my dear?' "'Very happy, sir.' replied Oliver. "'I'm very grateful indeed, sir, for your goodness to me.' "'Good boy,' said Mr. Brownlow stoutly. "'Have you given him any nourishment, Bedwin? Any slops, eh?' "'He has just had a basin of beautiful strong broth, sir,' replied Mrs. Bedwin, drawing herself up slightly, and laying strong emphasis on the last word, to intimate that between slops and broth well compounded, there existed no affinity or connection whatsoever. Ah, said Mr. Brownlow, with a slight shudder, "'a couple of glasses of port wine would have done him a great deal more good, wouldn't they, Tom White, eh?' "'My name is Oliver, sir,' replied the little invalid, with a look of great astonishment. "'Oliver?' said Mr. Brownlow. "'Oliver what? Oliver White, eh?' "'No, sir. Twist.' Oliver Twist. Queer name, said the old gentleman. What made you tell the magistrate your name was White? I never told him so, sir, returned Oliver in amazement. This sounded so like a falsehood that the old gentleman looked somewhat sternly in Oliver's face. It was impossible to doubt him. There was truth in every one of its thin and sharpened lineaments. Some mistake, said Mr. Brownlow. But although his motive for looking steadily at Oliver no longer existed, the old idea of the resemblance between his features and some familiar face came upon him so strongly that he could not withdraw his gaze. "'I hope you are not angry with me, sir,' said Oliver, raising his eyes beseechingly. "'No, no,' replied the old gentleman. "'Why, what's this? Bedouin, look there!' As he spoke, 
he pointed hastily to the picture over Oliver's head, and then to the boy's face. There was its living copy. The eyes, the head, the mouth, every feature was the same. The expression was, for the instant, so precisely alike, that the minutest line seemed copied with startling accuracy. Oliver knew not the cause of this sudden exclamation, for, not being strong enough to bear the start it gave him, he fainted away. A weakness on his part, which affords the narrative an opportunity of relieving the reader from suspense, in behalf of the two young pupils of the merry old gentleman, and of recording that when the Dodger and his accomplished friend Master Bates joined in the hue and cry which was raised at Oliver's heels, in consequence of their executing an illegal conveyance of Mr. Brownlow's personal property, as has been already described, they were actuated by a very laudable and becoming regard for themselves, and forasmuch as the freedom of the subject, and the liberty of the individual, are among the first and proudest boasts of a true-hearted Englishman, so I need hardly beg the reader to observe that this action should tend to exalt them in the opinion of all public and patriotic men, in almost as great a degree as this strong proof of their anxiety for their own preservation and safety goes to corroborate and confirm the little code of laws which certain profound and sound judging philosophers have laid down as the mainsprings of all nature's deeds and actions. The said philosophers very wisely reducing the good lady's proceedings to matters of maxim and theory and, by a very neat and pretty compliment, to her exalted wisdom and understanding, putting entirely out of sight any considerations of heart or generous impulse and feeling. For, these are matters totally beneath a female, who is acknowledged by universal admission to be far above the numerous little foibles and weaknesses of her sex. If I wanted any further proof of the strictly philosophical nature of the conduct of these young gentlemen in their very delicate predicament, I should at once find it in the fact, also recorded in a foregoing part of this narrative, of their quitting the pursuit, when the general attention was fixed upon Oliver, and making immediately for their home by the shortest possible cut. Although I do not mean to assert that it is usually the practice of renowned and learned sages to shorten the road to any great conclusion, their course indeed being rather to lengthen the distance by various circumlocutions, and discursive staggerings, like unto those in which drunken men, under the pressure of a too mighty flow of ideas, are prone to indulge. Still, I do mean to say, and do say distinctly, that it is the invariable practice of many mighty philosophers, in carrying out their theories, to evince great wisdom and foresight in providing against every possible contingency which can be supposed at all likely to affect themselves. Thus, to do a great right, you may do a little wrong, and you may take any means which the end to be attained will justify. The amount of the right, or the amount of the wrong, or indeed the distinction between the two, being left entirely to the philosopher concerned, to be settled and determined by his clear, comprehensive, and impartial view of his own particular case. It was not until the two boys had scoured, with great rapidity, through a most intricate maze of narrow streets and courts, that they ventured to halt beneath a low and dark archway. Having remained silent here, just long enough to recover breath to speak, Master Bates uttered an exclamation of amusement and delight, and, bursting into an uncontrollable fit of laughter, flung himself upon a doorstep, and rolled thereon in a transport of mirth. "'What's the matter?' inquired the Dodger. <laughs> roared Charlie Bates. "'How's your noise?' remonstrated the Dodger, looking cautiously around. "'Do you want to be grabbed, stupid?' <laughs> "'I can't help it,' said Charlie. Oh, "'I can't help it to see him splitting away at that pace, catching round the corners, and knocking, knocking up again the post, and starting on again as if he was made of iron as well as <laughs> and me, with a wipe in me pocket, singing out after him, oh, my eye. The vivid imagination of Master Bates presented the scene before him in two strong colours. As he arrived at this apostrophe, he again rolled upon the doorstep, and laughed louder than before. "'What'll Fagin say?' inquired the Dodger, 
taking advantage of the next interval of breathlessness on the part of his friend to propound the question. What? repeated Charlie Bates. Ah, what? said the Dodger. Why, what should he say? inquired Charlie, stopping rather suddenly in his merriment, for the Dodger's manner was impressive. What should he say? Mr. Dawkins whistled for a couple of minutes, then, taking off his hat, scratched his head and nodded thrice. "'What do you mean?' said Charlie. "'Too ralu ralu gammon and spinach, the froggy wouldn't, and I cockalorum,' said the Dodger, with a light sneer on his intellectual countenance. This was explanatory, but not satisfactory. Master Bates felt it so, and again said, "'What do you mean?' The Dodger made no reply, but putting his hat on again, and gathering the skirts of his long-tailed coat under his arm, thrust his tongue into his cheek, slapped the bridge of his nose some half-dozen times in a familiar but expressive manner, and turning on his heel, slunk down the court. Master Bates followed, with a thoughtful countenance. The noise of footsteps on the creaking stairs, a few minutes after the occurrence of this conversation, roused the merry old gentleman, as he sat over the fire with a saveloy and a small loaf in his hand, a pocket-knife in his right, and a pewter-pot on the trivet. There was a rascally smile on his white face as he turned round, and, looking sharply out from under his thick red eyebrows, bent his ear towards the door and listened. "'Why, how's this?' muttered the Jew, changing countenance. "'Only two of them. Where's the third? They can't have gone to trouble. Hark!' The footsteps approached nearer. They reached the landing. The door was slowly opened, and the Dodger and Charlie Bates entered, closing it behind them.